Maintaining a great company culture whenever everybody suddenly forced to work from home has been a big challenge. Everett and Co have a great story to tell and we're here to talk to Dorcas Crawford today about what they've done. Okay, Douglas, thanks very much for joining us for Lockdown Lessons. Um, could we start by covering off exactly what impact the initial lockdown in March had on the business here and what, what were the initial measures that you took? Yeah, like everybody else, it probably, even though we'd seen it in other places and, you know, Dublin was ahead of us and all of that, it's still on the day when we had to make the decision that came as, as kind of a shock and it was all... I actually remember in here it being a bit emotional really. Um, so the, we had the previous couple of weeks been preparing for it. We are not a business that tends to work from home. Obviously the nature of our business and being in and out of court or buying and selling people's properties and meeting with clients and all that kind of thing. Generally our work is not a work from home scenario. Um, so we did have to spend a bit of time the previous couple of weeks knowing probably it was coming and getting ready for it and making sure everybody had laptops set up, that our IT systems were in place and all of that. Um, so that bit we managed to prepare pretty quickly and pretty well for um, and got the sort of practicality sorted out pretty quickly and then worked through the decisions of how we were going to manage that. And I suppose because it's so strange now we've been through so many iterations of this, but I suppose at that point it was shut down. So in a way, you didn't have big decisions to make in terms of whether we're going to shut down or not. You just had to figure out how you were going to shut down effectively and not shut down. And obviously our main concern was making sure that we still provided the service that our clients needed because whatever your situation, you know, we had people in the middle of divorces, we had people in the middle of buying, selling houses, we had people with cases going to court, we had people with, who were maybe having to deal with disciplinary charges or criminal charges or whatever against them. So you couldn't just say work stops, work could not stop. So I suppose the first thing was how do we serve our clients and keep that level of service despite what's going to be happening in a position we've never ever been in before even I'm old enough to remember having struggled through bomb scares and buildings shutting down in the troubles and before we moved down to Hill Street we had a lot of that when we were right opposite the courts in the early 90s but even then we never had to shut down completely so it, it was quite a challenge. Um, I mean what, what were the main, you touched on it a little bit there, but what were the main concerns that you had at that stage both in terms of the the, the client delivery side and in terms of your own people I mean what were the what were the things that were foremost in your yeah, thoughts? Yeah in a way so first of all on the client side I mean we do pride ourselves you'll have seen walking up through the office uh, Peter the the um our, our logos and our things all talk about putting clients first putting people first and we do pride ourselves in that and we get some really excellent feedback from our clients that it is the kind of firm where they do feel that they're being looked after well and that it's a very um connected with clients and among staff so the first step was to make sure the clients were looked after and we could continue and we got made sure everybody had contact numbers and all of that on the staffing end of it for me was the part that I spent most of my time managing in preparation for lockdown and during lockdown and in the early stages of lockdown and still really because Edwards and Company anybody who knows us and a lot of people know us from Belfast are particularly um, will know that we are a very sociable um group of people um, and culture is a really really important factor in our business and I am a firm believer that if you look after your own staff and your own people that your productivity the work that you produce and your interest in your clients and the service you give to your clients will be so much better as a result so culture has always been a really big issue for us we're very sociable we're very chatty there's there's lots going on all the time we do our fundraisers for charity we engage in lots of things as a group of people there's a real kind of family atmosphere so I think that's one of the reasons on that day when we literally said okay at five o'clock tonight we're closing up here um, there were, it, it was actually really quite emotional, quite emotional just talking about it. Um, staff were upset that they were going to be, I mean, obviously everybody was anxious about um, isolation or about 
what was going to happen in the uncertainty. But yeah, people were really quite emotional as they went. So we managed to cheer ourselves up with a bit of humour as we usually do. The other thing that's really at the heart of our culture in Edwards and Company is humour. And um, we have a practice manager who's great crack and always manages to find a way of, of cheering us all up. So David came to me at lunchtime and said, we have a store full of toilet roll. Now, you will remember the bizarre thing that happened about toilet roll. And he said, what about if everybody can take 12, a pack of 12 toilet rolls as they leave? So we all had this hilarity as people were going out that day before we locked the doors that they took 12 toilet rolls home with them. So that gives a bit of a laugh and helped us. But yeah, that, that was the toughest challenge of all. And, and you'll hear me talk about that throughout managing that culture and keeping it at the really valuable um, connected level that it's always at was a tough challenge. And then, I mean, you, you've mentioned in an environment where working from home wasn't something that happened, how much attention and effort was required in order to, to make sure that that, those lev that level of interaction happened? Can you talk us through some of the things that you did, that you did. to try and make sure that yeah, so the, the IT bit was fairly easy. I mean, you just got somebody else to do it and we got everybody sorted out and that was fine. Um, one of the things we did, so our uh, support staff wouldn't normally have emails on their phone and things. They're not expected, obviously, to do that kind of work in the evenings. So we immediately checked with them how they would like to stay in touch. And they all said they were very happy to have work emails on their phone. So we got them set up very quickly with that. And that meant that we had a really easy way of communicating on a daily basis with everybody. So from the day we finished, the next day, I started every single morning sending an email that was just headed staying connected and to all the staff. And what that encouraged people to do was to have like a little 10 minute kind of email chat, if you like, um, and respond. And, you know, so I, I read everything I could plagiarize on motivation and keeping people connected and little quotes of the day and things like that and getting people to chip in. And that was something that I kept going throughout every morning before I did anything else. Usually when I did my morning walk at the town by, I'm fortunate enough to live down by Strangford Loch. And while I was doing my morning walk, I would think of something motivational or supportive to send and then come back, do my email first before I started work. And we would have maybe 10 minutes when people would connect with each other. And that was really important and that worked very well, very quickly. And then we also immediately set up a Friday Zoom drinks and quiz. Um, so every Friday from at four o'clock, everybody down tools and connected on Zoom. And most people engaged in it. Some people found it difficult. They were maybe had kids at home and things like that or whatever, other caring responsibilities. But most people did engage and that became a weekly thing. And again, it was just a bit of crack more than anything. The hardest bit I think about Zoom for social purposes is, it's not that easy. You know, people if people talk over each other, it doesn't really work very well. So it's hard to get that conversational. So we quite quickly realized that doing something like a quiz worked better than just like 30 people chatting is, is tough. Um, we also then did our, so with the um, solicitors for connecting workwise, we did a Tuesday morning Zoom, I think every week, which was just more about chatting. So very consciously trying to replace what the Americans call the water cooler chat. That's what we noticed was missing really quickly. So our Tuesday morning Zoom was just about that. It was just how was your weekend? What was going on? And then we did a more formal one, which we still do on a Thursday morning, which was always our whole team. We call it our town hall meeting where everybody sort of chips in about what work they've done and um, new work coming in and new clients and information that we need to exchange but also just quite encouraging stuff to see how the business is going and how people are connecting, you know. Okay, I mean, you've often, I mean, it's, it's not a new expression, but you often hear people saying, you know, the, the culture doesn't happen by accident. It sounds like quite a lot of your time over the period of the last six, seven, however long this is going to be, has been focusing on that bit of it. Is, is, is that right? I mean, is that something where the majority of your effort has been over the last year? Uh, yes, outside of my own work. Yeah, yeah, that is, I'd say, um, 
and I, and I felt that was a really, really important rule. I, I realised within a couple of days, I realised the day people were leaving and they were quite emotional about leaving that what they were feeling apart from the uncertainty of the world and the anxiety about what was going to happen with COVID-19, it was also just an anxiety about, well, when will we see each other again? When we, Because it, it is a really crucial part. So I picked that up quite quickly and I gave a lot of thought to that and I did spend the first, any webinar I could find about leadership and supporting and I was watching it in the evenings to try and get some ideas of how to do that. Um, because in the office it happens very naturally, but clearly that was not the case. So I put together sort of in my own mind a kind of plan of the stuff that I'd read and I realised that some of the key features, the first thing was support. People really, really needed support um, because of what was going on in the world, but also in their jobs where you, our office, you would be in somebody's office saying, oh, you know, I've got something really tricky this morning. What do you think? And bounce ideas off people. And, you know, the, the support staff would be helping each other out with maybe a new piece of work that they hadn't done for the court before. And that was lacking. So people were like, well, how am I going to cope when I need help? So I realised support was really important, not just for doing the job and helping looking after the clients, but also just... Um, in their own morale, they needed a lot of support. So that was one of my words. The second one was communicate. I read up and realized that communication was really, really crucial. And again, there would be a lot of communication normally, naturally in the office, but that couldn't happen. But also how important it was to communicate pe to people what we were doing, albeit the first few days we didn't really know. But even to be honest enough to say to people, look, we don't know what's gonna happen next week, but as soon as we do, we will tell you. And sometimes people even want to know if there's nothing to tell them, just to know you're thinking about it. And then very quickly, I think, it's hard to remember now because it was all a bit crazy, but I, I think very quickly we had the furlough scheme brought in. And I immediately then with David, my practice manager was able to email the staff and tell them exactly what would happen and how we would manage that for them. So communication was really, really key and keeping people communicating with each other and also not, doing overkill on the Zoom, you know, like have a phone call the way you would have had a phone call before. Somehow we went to this crazy thing where you couldn't just have an ordinary audio call. Yeah. So, and people were finding that exhausting. Yeah. So monitoring that and, and communicating, managing the method of communication as well as actually keeping people informed as much as you possibly could. And then my third word that I really focused on was motivating. Um, and just reminding people that they were doing a good job um, you know, helping to discuss each week what new work was coming in so that people knew there's plenty of work, it's all going well, you know, and giving feedback from clients and sharing that and just being able to say, look, we are in this together, the business is going well, we're still working, we're still looking after our clients, that kind of motivational stuff. And then the, the stuff that I was, as I say, plagiarizing from wonderful people like Charlie Maxey and his little drawings and sharing those in terms of keep up your spirits. Um, so yeah, those were my words that kind of guided me, support, communicate and motivate were the three things that made me, kept me on track okay, in, in managing. I mean, Given all those changes, I mean, has it changed your your perception going forward of, of how of how the business operates? Um, and I suppose what I'm asking is, are there any of those changes that you've made that you that you think could be longer lasting changes? And maybe think about how how you work day to day. Yeah, we've been forced to work from home far more, as I said, than we ever would normally, and I think. Um, and, and that's we've become very flexible in the way that we work. But when you're a client service, uh, you know, a service profession, you that's limited in some ways. You still have to be available to clients at certain times. That's what we do. That's what we are. Um, so, yes, we probably easily can approach it a bit more flexibly and we can also keep some of those options of working from home and doing all the rest of it but I honestly think the impact of people missing the culture here has been huge and I think that's something we really need to look out for you know I, I do think there's a lot of talk about how wonderful it is working from home yes it is if you've got a nice house and an office and you know but but you may have people young people sharing a very small flat where they've nowhere to work from home except their their bedroom which is not healthy for anybody and I think that we need to be very careful that yes working from home maybe for the privileged people but there are a lot of people who that's not easy for and so I wouldn't be diving straight into saying yes we're all going to work from home from now on it's not 
possible entirely for us anyway in our profession. But also I think we need to think really carefully about what people need, what makes work work. And, you know, one of the indications for me is that our staff couldn't wait to come back from furlough. Um, and just we're, we're, when can we when can we come back into the workplace? So of course, time wise, we're now in this phase where we've gone into a bit more of lockdown again, or gone backwards in a way. So we are small smaller numbers again at the minute in the office. But it, it definitely, I'd say we we'll have to find a way of managing still holding on to that culture as best we can. And in a strange way, I mean, from what you're saying, is there? Is there a, a possibility that the the happenings over the last six or seven months have actually galvanised the, the culture that you have by by almost you know by taking people out of that environment that they enjoy being in for mm. a period of time that they never thought they would be taken out of? Yes. Um, but it has the potential when people come back into it to make them all the more appreciative for. And not just here, but in, yeah. but in any organisation. I think that's right. I think the, the thing that we have to be really careful about is that loneliness factor. And if you do have a good culture, it, then that's all the more stark um, when you're away from it. So certainly our um, staff are missing, really missing the kind of go for the odd drink on a Friday night around the corner of the Duke of York or, you know, have lunches together and things that we do. And our, we do a lot of charity fundraising and those are events that we, you know, will organise something in the office or a coffee morning across the road. Those things are really, really crucial. So I think you're right. It is possible that people have appreciated it because it's been taken away from them. And let's just hope that... It isn't too long before we can get back to it, but I think probably the learning is that maybe for some people we could allow them to be more flexible. And I, I think probably in the overall scheme of things, not just ourselves, but other businesses, we probably will end up more of a hybrid scenario where people can do both. Um, and I, I just would hope that people don't leave behind the culture when they're thinking, oh, we can save a fortune by not having offices. You know, you could end up, everybody, I mean, there's so much good research on, on good culture affecting productivity. And, you know, you could very easily look at your bottom line and think, well, we can save our rent. But in fact, you've lost an element of productivity that would have easily paid for the rent. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to be broad-minded in how we approach it in the future. And from a from a personal perspective, then what what's been your biggest sort of personal learning over the last seven months? Um, I'd say that probably having more of an insight into what is important to our staff um, and my colleagues as well. I have always known it was important to people, but probably I'm drooling on about this so much about how important it is, is partly because I've really realised it's, you know, personally, I'm I'm a person who feeds off other people's energy. So working from home, I haven't particularly enjoyed. Um, I, I, I probably am more productive because I chat to people less <laughs> around the office. And um, but I really miss the, the buzz of noise going on around me personally. Um, so I did read about an app that created fake office noise, which I keep meaning, I've, now that you've reminded me of that, I might download that. Um, I don't like working in silence. Um, so I, I kind of maybe have the radio on really low or things like that. But what I actually miss is just the buzz of people around me and knowing that I can go and ask somebody. You know, we've got, also got into these terrible habits of texting somebody to say, can you take a call? I suddenly remembered the other day when you just lifted the phone and called people out. I don't know why that happened, but it happened. So it seems like there are a lot of formalities in place that are now like steps you have to take to arrange a phone call with somebody. Whereas in the office, you'd stick your head in their door and say, what do you think about this? So I know that for me personally, um, that's, I've learned that about myself. Uh, you know, I'd always operated that way. I wasn't surprised to learn it, but I've kind of been much clearer on the impact that's had on me. So whilst I can work very solidly for an hour and get loads done, I'm kind of then like wandering around looking for the dog to have a wee chat, you know. Is there, I mean, is there something about that focus on the productivity side of things then that, that if, if the focus is solely on how much you get done, then the argument is, well, look, I'm more productive at home. Yeah. But if you look at the quality necessarily of those outputs because they're, because they're maybe lacking that, yeah. 
interaction where you're able to say, have a look at that for me, would you, for five minutes? And somebody goes, oh, no, no, don't do that. Yeah. Um, so the, the productivity surely isn't just about the volume of stuff that gets it done. It looks better it, on the bottom yeah. line, but actually when you took, take it over a period of months, you might. I would be surprised if you don't find that that productivity lacks. And one of the things that's really interesting, I've talked to a couple of colleagues about this um, as lawyers, is that like most of what I learned as a young lawyer was from shadowing somebody or from sitting in on court cases or sitting in on client interviews or just watching how somebody else did it or listening to my old boss who was an absolute genius at phone calls with people and had just a brilliant way with him and learning those things and picking up the little tips about the law as you went along and that kind of worries me a bit that when we get into remote working and working on your own that where do where do people learn that? And funny, I was, that's, I've spoken to a few other lawyers about it and I was talking to another friend who's an accountant and we were saying so much of your profession and your skills you learn from being with other people who are more senior and who are good at it and hopefully. <laughs> and that's something that I, I think we need to also put into the mix. So again, it's not just productivity. You might get the job done, but you haven't had the chance to watch somebody else do it and think, could I do it better next time? I mean, and I suppose to finish it off, I mean, we're, we're, the whole purpose of this series is, is in, a, in a not very positive environment to try and take a positive look forward. So, I mean, do you think overall, I suppose you'll, everybody will try to do this, but do you think overall this, this could end up being, a, a, having a, the experience could end up having a positive effect on both the people and the business as we go forward? I'm really torn on that one. I had a long conversation with some colleagues the other week about could somebody said because the way their business had changed around and they'd pivoted and all of that because of COVID and somebody said you could almost say you were grateful for COVID and there was a great reaction in the room including from me saying hold on there are a lot of people well first of all a lot of people have died a lot of people have suffered there have been horrendous things have happened to people and people have gone out of business so again we need to be really careful about being those privileged people who we did okay out of it and this my business has done fine but that sounds like a very privileged thing to say so but on the other hand I think that what you have to do is be positive about the opportunities that have arisen so you know there's no point in feeling miserable constantly because it's here and we have to deal with it. And, and our approach in Edwards Company would always be, you know, a very positive approach to things that we do. Again, it's our culture. So I think it's really important to take positive lessons from it and to see that there were some things that maybe brought people closer together. Maybe our businesses flourished for some people. Um, and yes, those are positive things. But at the same time, I think we must not ever forget that some people have really struggled and have lost their business and all of that. So I think we, we take what we can that's positive. We learn our lessons. We, yes, it has taught me and, and I think all of us here what a valuable thing a really good workplace culture is um, and how much we missed it when we lost it, as you said, and to just make sure we don't ever take that for granted. <laughs> <laughs>